This example is from the text Conceptual Dynamics. Specifically, this is example problem 8.5-2. The problem statement reads, Consider a 5 kilogram disc rolling to the right under the influence of A, a pulling force P equals 10 newtons, and B, a moment M equals 10 newton meters. Assume that the disc rolls without slip on the stationary ground. The disc has a radius of 1.0 meters. If the disc starts from rest, determine in each case the velocity of the disc's mass center after it has moved 5 meters. So in reading the problem, we try to identify what's given and what it is we're trying to find. We're given the mass of the disc. We're given, in the two different cases, either an applied force, P equals 10 newtons, or an applied moment, M equals 10 newton meters. We're told the radius of the disk. We're told that it starts from rest. We're told that it rolls without slip. And we want to determine the velocity after the disk has moved 5 meters. So that basically gives us a sense of the problem, what we're given, what we're trying to find. In further understanding the problem, we should draw a picture, uh, in particular draw a free body diagram to help understand what's happening. So in the first case, we have this applied force P. The disc has some weight. There'll be a normal force of the ground reacting to the disc pushing on the ground, and there will be a friction force. And so just looking at what's happening here, we can sort of imagine that the disc is going to roll this way such that it has some angular acceleration and angular velocity in the clockwise direction, and the disc is going to roll to the right, so it's going to accelerate to the right you know, as generated by this P force. So looking at this, if we were to sum the moments about the mass center, all of the forces pass through the mass center, the weight, the normal force, and the applied force P. So none of these forces are going to induce a moment that causes the disk to rotate, that causes this angular acceleration. And so the only force that can cause that is the friction force. And in order to induce it to accelerate in the clockwise direction, the friction force needs to be to the left. In the second case, we again have the weight. We again have a normal force. We have no applied force P, but we have an applied moment M. And so again, we can imagine that it's going to roll and accelerate in the clockwise direction, and it's going to roll to the right. And so if we look in this case, um, the moment can cause this angular acceleration in the clockwise direction. The weight and the normal force are completely in the vertical direction. So the only thing that could cause this acceleration to the right, this translation to the right, would be the friction force. And therefore, it needs to be that way. And so again, we can sort of deduce the direction of the friction force based on the resulting angular acceleration and the resulting translational acceleration. So now that we've seen what the forces are, what we're given and what we're trying to find, we can think about the type of kinetic analysis approach we should use. Since we have a situation where we have a force acting over a distance or a moment acting over an angular displacement, it's natural to gravitate towards a work energy approach because a work energy approach uh, directly captures the effect of a force or a moment over a displacement, over a distance. And so that's the approach we're going to use. The weight 
is a conservative force, so we can capture that in terms of the potential energy. In general, the normal force doesn't do work because it's perpendicular to the, uh, to the direction of the displacement. The friction force in this case won't do work either because we're told that the disc rolls without slip. And if you recall, in the case where we have a disc rolling without slip, its contact point is an instantaneous center of zero velocity. If the friction force is applied at a point that's not moving, it's not doing any work. So the only forces and moments that we need to consider the work of is the applied force P and the moment M. And so we'll consider them case A. If we recall, in this case, we want to find the work done by the force P. P is constant, and it's in the direction of the displacement. So we can just calculate the work as the force times the displacement. The only thing that we need to be a little bit careful about with rigid bodies is that the work done is based on the displacement of the point of application of the force. When we're dealing with a particle, the displacement of the particle and the displacement of the point of application of the force are identical. With a rigid body, they don't necessarily have to be. Um, but in this case, since the, the force P is applied at the mass center, the displacement of G and the displacement of the point of application of the force P will be equal. And the force is 10 Newtons it moves through a distance of five meters and so that we get that the work done by the force is 50 joules and it's positive because the force and its displacement are in the same direction for case b the work done by the applied moment is calculated as the moment times the angular displacement that the moment acts through. Since we are told that the disk rolls without slip, we know that the displacement of the center of mass is equal to the radius of the disk times its angular displacement. And so we can rewrite this angular displacement as the displacement of the mass center divided by the radius r. So we're told that the applied moment is 10 Newton meters, the displacement of the mass center is five meters, and the radius is one meter. And so the meters cancel. We have 10 Newton meters times five, which is equal to 50 Newton meters or 50 joules, which is identical to what we had in case A. Now that we've calculated the work done by the force in the moment in each of the two cases, we'll move to the next slide to, to finish our calculations. So on this slide, I've repeated all of the information we've been given in addition to what we're trying to find. I've also repeated the free body diagrams. In both cases, the work done by the applied force and the applied moment are equal. So from this point forward, case A and case B, the, their solution will be identical. Recall that we're going to use a work energy approach to solving this problem since we have a force or a moment applied over a distance. And so thinking back to the work energy principle, we have the initial energy of the system, its kinetic energy and its potential energy, plus the work done on the system will be equal to the final energy of the system. In this case, the mass center stays at the same height because the disk is rolling on level ground. So there will be no change in potential energy. The potential energy at state one will be equal to the potential energy at state two. And so they just cancel out. Since we're told that the disk begins at rest, the initial kinetic energy is zero. And we have then that the work done on the disk will equal its final kinetic energy. Since we have a rigid body that is both translating and rotating, the kinetic energy 
we'll have a piece that's due to the translation of the disk in particular as a function of the velocity of the mass center. And it'll also have a portion due to the rotation of the disk. Since we're told that it rolls without slip, we have that VG2 is equal to the radius times the angular acceleration, the angular velocity at state two. And we may recall that the mass moment of inertia of a disk about its mass center is one half mR squared. And so using that information, we have everything that we need in order to solve for V. We have one half mv squared. We have one half the mass moment of inertia, which is one half mR squared times the angular velocity squared, which is just the translational velocity divided by the radius. That's squared. So this radius squared and that radius squared will cancel. If we want to solve for v, we can factor the v squared from both terms, divide through, So on the left-hand side, we have the work. We can multiply through by 4 to clear out these fractions. We can divide through by m. If we do that, when we multiply through by 4, we'll be left with a 2 here. When we multiply through by the 4, it'll cancel those out. The m is brought out front. So it'll just be 1. Then, in order to get rid of the squared, we'll need to take the square root of both sides. Substituting in the values that we have, we have 4 times the work done, which is 50 joules, or 50 newton meters, times the mass, which is 5 kilograms, times 3. So the kilograms will cancel the kilograms in the newton, because a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And so we'll have a meter per second squared times a meter. That'll be meter squared over second squared. That'll give us the units we expect, meters per second. Then we'll have 4 times 50 divided by 15. Take the square root of that. We get that the final velocity is approximately 3.65 meters per second. And that will be the resulting velocity in both cases, both for the applied force P and the applied moment M. And so that brings us to the conclusion of this example.